We're starting a new series today called Thank You, and it's appropriate because it's the thank you season. It's the Thanksgiving season, and we know Thanksgiving is coming up on us really, really quickly. We have a lot to thank people for. I'll tell you one thing that we should be thankful for is the United States of America, right? We should be grateful for our nation. Absolutely. As a matter of fact, this weekend is a great time for us to be able to celebrate uh, our country by thinking of those people who have served us uh, and have many have given their lives. We have so many veterans who still represent uh, who we are. If you are, if you've ever served in the military at all, if you're a veteran, would you please stand up all over the worship center? Any of those? Okay. Awesome. Awesome. Don't sit down, okay? Please remain standing. We are so grateful for your service. We are. Okay, this is what I want you to do. I want, I want in just a second, I'm going to ask everybody else to stand up. But what I want you to do, those people who are sitting, uh, standing next near you, okay, veterans near you, I want those people close to those veterans to hug on them. All right? So everybody stand right now. And if, you, if a veteran is close to you, I want you to give them a hug and just say thank you for what they've uh, done. Awesome. <laughs> That's great. Okay, I want you to go back to your seat. That this, don't sit down, okay? I want you to go back, go back to your seat. I'm going to ask the veterans, if you will, to sit, okay? The veterans, if you'll sit, and the rest of us, let's give them a standing ovation for what they've done for us, all right? We are, wow. That's amazing. That's amazing. Thank you very much. You can be seated. I hope you feel the love today. I hope you can really sense that we appreciate everything that you've done. Well, we do have a lot to be thankful for, and not only do we, are we thankful for our country and those who served it, but we ought to be thankful for other people around us. Our family, obviously, people who are significant to us, and we ought to be thankful for those people who are helping us really develop into be, being people who truly are Christ-like. I want to talk to you about being thankful today because having the attitude of thankfulness changes radically your life. I was reading a study recently about how really having the spirit of gratitude or thankfulness has effects on other parts of who we are. The study was done by uh, Robert Emmons, who's a psychology professor at the University of California at Davis. And he's studying something which has become now positive psychology within the uh, psychiatric uh, world. Positive psychology. And the whole part of this that's important is that when we have positive thought connected to this, our thankfulness, it changes other areas of our life. So I want you to hear, uh, when we have the spirit of thankfulness, what happens? It take, uh, those people who do this take better care of themselves physically and mentally. In other words, they're making wiser choices about how they treat their bodies, whether it's food or exercise, whatever it may be. Second is this, that they have improved mental alertness, that they're thinking in a good light, understanding that I need to make really good decisions that affect people in a positive way. Something else is we cope better with stress and daily challenges. In other words, when pressures come, we're able to withstand those things and maintain a positive spirit. We feel happier and more optimistic about, about things that are happening in our life, even when there's struggles. And the last one is this, we maintain a brighter view of the future. That's what happens when we have a spirit of thankfulness. Y'all, this was not a Christian study. This is a secular study, which puts a lot of weight behind what we're going to read today from the Apostle Paul, who said this, in all circumstances, give thanks. It's true. It's absolute reality. He knew something back then that we should know now and to apply it to our lives. So what does this look like? Well, I want to read some scripture today where we hear that. And I also want to use it as the basis to teach us about how it is that we can maintain that thankful spirit. It's found in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 12, where we read this. Now we ask you, brothers and sisters, to acknowledge those who work hard among you, who care for you in the Lord, and who admonish you. Hold them in the highest regard and love because of their work. 
Live in peace with each other. And we urge you, brothers and sisters, warn those who are idle and disruptive. Encourage the disheartened. Help the weak. Be patient with everyone. Make sure that nobody pays back wrong for wrong, but always strive to do what is good for each other and for everyone else. Rejoice always. Pray continually. Here it is. Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. That last statement is huge. It's God's will for you to be thankful in all circumstances. Now, we hear this statement. I've heard this many times about praying continually and and rejoicing always and giving thanks in all circumstances. And many times we take that scripture and just set it aside and say, okay, that's how we're supposed to do it. But what we need to do is to back up in what Paul said to hear what he was teaching before he made those statements to figure out how we can do it. How can we maintain the spirit of thankfulness in our lives? Well, we have to become certain types of people. And when we keep our attention on the right things, it helps us, again, have this heart of gratitude. So I want to share with you, um, I know there are a lot of them on your sheet today. There are like six of them. Uh, Last service, I got through two. All right? Uh, So I just want to say that to you so you don't freak out. All right? Uh, Thinking we're going to be here past lunch. It's not going to happen. All right. So anyway, we're going to go through a couple of these for sure. And now the problem is I've said we went through two. So you're going to expect me now to stop after two when I probably want to do three, but I will stop after two. How's that? Okay. Because I know your psychology. What's the type of people that we're supposed to be on your outline sheet? Number one, let's fill it in that we in all circumstances are to be acknowledgers, that we're to acknowledge things about other people. When we see these things in other people, we ought to give thanks because they are this way. The Bible said it in verse 12. Now we ask you, brothers and sisters, to acknowledge, circle the word acknowledge, those who work hard among you, who care for you in the Lord, and who admonish you. There are three different reasons why we should acknowledge people and give thanks for them. It comes straight from the scripture. Go ahead and fill in the first one, which said this. Those who work hard. We are to acknowledge those people who work hard and to give thanks for people who do that very thing. Working hard is important. And when you, when you look at this, and I hear the word work, what I do just immediately in my mind is associated with people who are out in business, who are out in the field, or whoever, it, whoever they are, who work in those ways, to earn a living or to support a community, whatever. But when you look at this, the work is not just about those things. It's the work they do to help make us better. Because as you go through this statement, it's about uh, to, to work hard, and immediately it talks about caring for other people. We should appreciate those people who are working hard who want to help improve our lives. I just mentioned a study. There is another study done by Carol DeWitt, and it's about the growth mindset. As a matter of fact, she came up with this idea of the growth mindset, and what uh, she did to learn about this is they did a study, and it was a study of older elementary school students. They separated them into two groups, and they took the first group, and they put them in a room, and they had puzzles for them, all right? And they would do the puzzles, and after they finished the puzzles, they took them into another room, and they said something to them. You're so smart. You're so smart. You're so smart. You're so smart. Trying to encourage them. You're so smart. You're so smart. Because they finished the puzzle. I mean, you're so smart. So obviously when people start telling you that, start believing you're smart. Well, then there was another group of people, group of kids. They took them to the room. Same puzzle. The kids finished the puzzles. All right. They finished them like the other kids did. They finished the puzzles then took them to another room. And they said this. They didn't say you're so smart. They said you worked so hard. You work so hard. You work so hard. The amazing thing about this study is they brought all those kids back into the room and they had two different puzzles now. One that was an easy puzzle and one that was a more difficult puzzle. And they wanted to see where these kids would go. I mean, the people who you told them, you're so smart, you're so smart, which one would they gravitate to? The one that you work so hard, you work so hard, which one did they gravitate to? This is just shocking to me because I would think it would be the opposite. But the kids that uh, they were told, you're so smart, you're so smart, went to the easiest puzzle. 
Now, when you start thinking about why they would do that, it's for this reason. They don't want anybody to think they're not smart, so they need to make sure they do something they know they can do so people will look at them as smart. But the other kids who say, you work so hard, you work so hard, they gravitated to the one that was more difficult because they were told you work hard and when you start believing that, you can work hard to do, th- do something that you've never done before. Isn't that amazing? You work hard. That's what we're talking about right here. You work hard. And see, that's what the whole uh, idea about work is, is to help bring change. It's to do something that may be difficult for a positive experience. And that's what happened within the church. There were some people who were doing hard work to help people within the community who were doing things that needed to change. That's the second thing that we learn on your sheet. It says this, that those who care about us, we are to acknowledge those who care about us. Someone who cares about us, they are troubled or concerned about us. They look at us and they see what we're doing and making bad choices in what we say and what we do and realize if we continue to go down that pathway, we are not going to have a good life. We're not going to experience joy. We're going to be discouraged in our life. A person who cares is to the point where they are bothered by that in other people. I mean, they see it as like, that just really bothers me that if they keep doing this, man, they're just going to destroy their lives. So what happens for that person? A person who is bothered by that does the work that we just talked about to make sure that doesn't happen because they care about them. We ought to be grateful for people, to thank God for people who see us and care about us that way and who are willing to work to help bring positive change in our lives because we need positive change. There's a third thing that it talks about, that we're to acknowledge those who help us overcome our challenges. We have challenges. There's no doubt about it. There are things that we struggle with and we need somebody to help us with. Uh, When it talks about this, the word admonish uh, means this, that they uh, look at a person and they they want to caution them. They want to advise them. They want to say things uh, to help improve who they are. I mean, you just mentioned that, but they want them to be better. That's what we do when when we admonish people. Another study, I know I'm doing all these studies. There's a third one. It'll be the last one I talk about. Just say it really quick. There was another study, again, uh, dealing with, with young people. And they got these kids together, and they, they did a little interview with the parents. And they found out the parents who really praised their kids for the things they did. Hey, man, you, that was awesome. It was awesome. Kept building up, praising them, praising them, praising them, praising them. All right? Uh, so they, they did that with one group uh, of kids. And what they did in the study is they brought them all together and they were, you know, gave them some tests or whatever it was to see who was better as far as their growth in doing what they asked them to do. Now, there was a second group of people, all right? There, was the, there were the, the parents who praised, 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 but there were another group of people who did something different. The parents gave feedback. They would say, yeah, you did that well, but they would give feedback about how they could improve in other areas of their life. So one parent praised, 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 oh, you're awesome, you're awesome, and the other one, hey, that was good, but gave feedback to help them be better. Guess who? did better on the test. You already know it. Not only the one who said you did well, but had the feedback that they needed to improve. That's the thing about parenting many times or anything. Hey, that was great, that was great, that was great. But we need to talk to people about the issues that are challenging to them to help them be better. Y'all, we need that in our lives because we face temptations. All of us face temptations. And we need somebody to help us overcome those temptations. I'll give you... Excuse me, a quick example of that. Um, there, and I just, I'm not going to say who it is, all right? You're going to immediately associate it with somebody. I know that you are, okay? So you can do what you want to. But here's the thing. There are some people who love ice cream, okay? I mean, just absolutely love ice cream, who are addicted to sugar. I am one of those people who are addicted to sugar. I mean, I just love it, love it. And it's bad for me. I went to the doctor recently, and he's like, man, this is wrong with you. This is wrong with you. You need to change your diet. And it's like, you're Satan, okay? That's how I felt about him. So <laughs> anyway, uh, so you're supposed to change your diet and do, do all these things. Well, I want you to imagine something, 
All right? I want you to imagine something. I want you to imagine this person, which it happens, it happens to be a true story, okay? But just imagine this person. They go to the store, and they're addicted to sugar, and they love every time they, just about every time they go, they get ice cream. But, you know, people just don't do it. You shouldn't get the ice cream. So they have to go down the frozen goods aisle because on one side of the frozen goods aisle is frozen food, and they needed something. On the other side is the ice cream. Well, uh, when walking down, I mean, obviously, you should never look at the ice cream, okay? That's the first problem you have when you look at the ice cream. You should always keep your attention away from that. But here's the thing about this person who walked down the aisleway. They didn't know that the store manager had been influenced by the devil <laughs> to give a buy one, get one free on haagen all right? Is that not the devil or what? And guess what they did? <laughs> they, bought the, they bought the haagen -Dazs, obviously. They bought the haagen -Dazs. That's what happens uh, in our world. We all have temptations around us. We, we have those things, and it's easy for us to give into those things that are not healthy for us. But we need people speaking into our lives to help us see, you know what, if we continue to do that, not only your physical health is bad, but our spiritual health is not good. Aren't you thankful for people like that who would help hold us accountable to do those things? It's hard to be thankful, but it helps us maintain that thankful spirit. Number two on your sheet be the last thing that we deal with. We are to, in all circumstances, be peacers. I just coined a word, all right? Peace, we're to be a peacer. Okay, peace or it's about peace. We hear the scripture. I want you to read it out loud together with me. First Thessalonians 5.13. Here we go. Let's read. Live in peace with each other. So we're to be at peace with everyone around us. We need people who help us experience peace. When you look at peace, obviously it's the absence of war. I mean, you could look at a little definition of it, and some dictionaries would tell you that. So I've shared with you uh, many times uh, about this, that there are three different states of a relationship. There's a relationship that's in peace, and a relationship in peace looks like this. Uh, both people uh, care for the other person and want the best for the other person. When that happens, there's peace. There's always peace. And there's another relationship where one cares about the other person and wants the best for them, but the other person cares about themselves and wants the best for themselves. There's conflict in those relationships. The third type is the war relationship, right? Both people only care about themselves and want the best for themselves. And that brings war into a relationship. Now, the Bible just told us that we are to treat people with peace. We are to desire peace in all circumstances. And it's interesting to me that Paul would say this because it makes me think that maybe there wasn't some peace in some relationships for him to feel like he needed to say something about this. So what do we do then? Will we look at our life and say, well, where does this problem with peace come from? Because when both of us always care about the other person, then there's always peace. In fact, on your outline sheet, I want you to fill in that first statement, which says this, to desire the best for others, that we are to desire the best for others. But we begin realizing that we're not desiring the best for others because of something that we do. And the scripture talked about it. I just skipped over the scripture, but I want you to go back and look at the scripture right before this. It says this in 1 Thessalonians 5, 15, make sure that nobody pays back wrong for wrong, but always strive to do what is good for each other and for everyone else. There it is, right? We know we're not at peace. We want to get them. We want to, we do, just say, do we want to pay them back for whatever happened? The behavior or what they said to us, we want to do something to make them experience pain which is completely ungodly, right? It's completely not the way in which we are supposed to live so that we can bring peace in the lives of others. Here's how people, we need to think about what, our, what is our role in this? What role have I played in peace? If there's conflict, I need to ask the question, am I the one that began caring about myself and wanted myself to be successful? Did I do that? Okay, here's another part of it. Am I the person who got sucked into it 
If I was a person, there was this, the other one in the relationship, they started only caring about themselves and wanted to be successful. They started doing that, and then they started doing to us, something to us, and we began paying attention to their behavior instead of the fact that God wants us to be at peace. We start uh, focusing on their behavior, and we get sucked into it. Do I have a witness out there from anyone, right? I mean, this is so easy that you get sucked into it because somebody does something and we begin looking at their actions and not seeing who it is that God wants us to be. Now here, this is gonna be really hard to like, comp- maybe not so hard to comprehend. We need to be thankful for the people who are trying to cause a war. That sounds really weird. Now here's the reason for that because God created everybody, right? Right? So we ought to be thankful for everybody that God created. We ought to look at them as valuable and say, you know what, they are valuable and I need to do something to help them experience peace with God more than anything else. But here's the other issue. That person is helping me grow stronger in my faith as I continue to thank God in it. Just personal application, all right? I am grateful today for LSU. Okay? Many of you know I'm an Alabama fan, a big-time Alabama fan. And if you didn't keep up with the uh, sporting scores yesterday, LSU beat Alabama. They cheated, but anyway, they still (laughs) beat. I am totally kidding. Okay, they did not cheat. They were the better. I will acknowledge they, they they were the better team yesterday. They beat Alabama. Now, why am I grateful for that? Because I learned humility overnight. Right? I mean, I learned humility. Something didn't go my way, and it caused me to have a growth experience. Like, who cares? I mean, seriously, you know what's going to happen next year? They're going to start all over again. They keep doing this over and over. It, it just, I saw somebody in the stands yesterday praying, and I'm thinking, seriously? I mean, do you really, you know what I think God is doing? God's like, I gave them free will, and they created football? You know what I mean? It's like, they, and they keep doing it. They keep getting angry. They, they created football and you're praying, asking for whatever it is about this. What we should be grateful for is whatever it is that challenges us to grow. But in our growth, we know that we've grown when we stop trying to stab them in the back and to help heal them. To help do what's necessary to bring change in their lives. Y'all, we ought to be grateful for people like that. Okay, what happens? When peace comes, there's, there's something that occurs because of peace. And, and this is just a practical kind of thing. And really, God is involved in this. But when we come to, to peace, we have an agreement about what we're supposed to do so there can be peace. On your outline sheet, I want you to fill in that statement. It says this, we come to an agreement. Now, what the world calls this is a peace treaty. So we come up with the rules. These are the rules that everybody is to follow. And if we follow these rules, then we are going to be at peace with each other. I want, you to, I want you to maybe have a different way to look at this, but God gave us a peace treaty. The peace treaty are the commands that God gave us. Because this is what God said. This is how you're supposed to behave. You're supposed to, look at the Ten Commandments. You know, love the Lord your God with all your you know, you love you know, honor God on the Sabbath. Do the, I mean, all these different. Don't cheat on your wife. Don't steal. Don't murder. All these things He gives. So then you look at this and say, that's the peace treaty. If things are going to be cool between me and you, you got to follow these rules. Well, then the problem becomes, all right. So I'm supposed to spend my life trying to follow those rules. That's not it. That's not how we're supposed to look at this. God gave us the rules to help us see if we are peaceful people. God gave us the rules to help us see, do I love other people more than I love myself? Because if I love other people more than I love myself, if I love God in this way, I will automatically obey all of the rules. Here's the treaty. Here's what you're supposed to do. And for us as men, if I just have a heart for other people and put other people before myself and want the success of other people, I don't have an issue at all. There's always peace when people do that together. 
So when I look at my life and I look at the commands God gives me, those commands are so important because it points out behavior to us where we're messing up and where we need to change. It's important for us to have this agreement. It's, it's important for us to know the expectations. I shared this a few weeks ago. Um, I just want to add something to it. <clears throat> I was talking about Jennifer, and which I do a lot. I, y'all, I want you to... She is awesome, okay? She is the most wonderful person I've ever met, and I know that you probably think that of your spouse or somebody else, and once again, you're wrong. But anyway, uh, I'm just kidding. Uh, She's the most wonderful person, and sometimes I feel like I say some things to put her in a negative light, and I I apologize for that, y'all, because if I do, I'm just trying to make myself feel better about my evil behavior, okay? That's basically what I'm trying to do because she is the sweetest, kindest, most wonderful person in the world, okay? So I want you to hear that before I say what I say. Okay, uh, so anyway, a few weeks ago, y'all remember this if you were here, a few weeks ago, I, she said something to me which was very convicting. I had the habit of, you know, I'd eat whatever, and she's a great cook, I'd eat, and I would go put the dish on top of the dishwasher, and I would walk away. And she made a comment to me one day, and she said, Tim, it's so amazing to me but that you can get the plate as far as on the top of the dishwasher, and you can't seem to get it in the dishwasher. That's what she said to me. And it was really kind. It was a really great statement. And I felt so convicted by what she said. I did. I mean, it really bothered me that she said this because I felt like, man, I'm being so selfish. So I started putting the dish in the dishwasher. I even, y'all get this, this is crazy. I started emptying the dishwasher. All right, this is even more crazy. I had her give me an orientation about how to start the dishwasher, okay? Now I've done all this, and when I started doing it, Jennifer was saying, Tim, that's awesome. You know, thank you so much, and she wouldn't use the word awesome, but she's like, thank you so much for doing that. I noticed, hey, this morning when you got up, you emptied the dishwasher, and she, I mean, really, for a couple of weeks, man, she was doing this all the time, and I mean, I just made it feeling good doing this. And then I kept doing it, and then I noticed something. She stopped thanking me, all right? And... Something had happened where it went from gratitude to an expectation. It was an expectation. You know, my issue in all that was this. I shouldn't be doing something so that people thank me for it. I should do something because it's making the other person's life better. Now, what I'm afraid of now, and she hasn't said it to me yet, is, Tim, why didn't you empty the dishwasher, okay? That's what I'm waiting for now, and she hasn't said that, nor do I think she'd ever say that, but we do things for the good of other people. That's why it is, because they do what is good for us. Final thing on your sheet for number two, I just want to give you this statement. You experience peace of mind, okay? That's what happens. When we are people who are thankful for all of those who do this. Y'all, do you remember this, what I said about the beginning of it? We have, we have peace of mind. We, we are positive about this. And let me help you. I'll just give you one more really practical thing about this. You can remain thankful if you put your attention on the future and not the present. When you look to the future and see hope that someone can change, hope for a better future, You remain thankful, but when you only look at what's happening the here and now, you focus on behavior, which gives you a negative perspective of life. You know why we should have our attention on the future? Not only because those people need a better future, but y'all, we have eternal life to look forward to. Praise God. Amen? That's what we have to look forward to in Him. I want you to bow your heads. Close your eyes right now.